Hey everybody, this is the study guide answers for the unit three part one supply and demand test on Monday. I have tried very hard all morning to get this out to you guys and it has been brutal. Okay, so uh, remember that this stuff has been around forever. Supply and demand are used every single minute of every single day and every single aspect of, of everything, especially in market economies. So the answers are out there. Try using ACDC econ that website uh, try using the uh, crash course economics uh, stuff just type in your phrases on there the answers are out there but without further ado let's go and look at the answers for our study guide okay so definition so number one demand demand is defined as the willingness to buy a good and or service and the ability to pay for it so willingness and ability to pay for it is crucial for it. it's consumers too that do this Number two, supply, the willingness and ability of producers to offer goods and services for sale. And this is a producer, people that are making the things that are also have to be willing and able to buy. Now let's apply that to the laws. Number three, law of demand says, as the price of a good or service increases, the quantity demanded decreases. And as the price drops, quantity demanded rises. And also on top of that, for number four, law of supply says that suppliers will normally offer more for sale at high prices and less for sale at low prices. And this makes sense because if you sell more at higher prices, you're gonna make more money. And if, if you're not gonna make much money, you're not gonna sell that many things. Uh, you're not gonna offer them for sale. Number four, law of supply. Suppliers will normally offer more for sale at uh, high prices and less for sale at lower prices again. Number five, in demand, quantity supplied and price have what kind of relationship? That's an inverse. As one goes up, the other is down. As price goes up, quantity goes down. As quantity goes up, price goes down. And number six, in supply, quantity supplied and price have what type of relationship? And that's a direct one. As price goes up, so does quantity. As quantity goes down, so does price. Okay, and otherwise, having other things affecting it, that's how it will work. But remember, we know that we're going to look at these demand determinants in a little bit to kind of understand these situations. Next. Change in demand versus change in quantity demanded. Now, it's important to know the difference between those two things. Graph A is a change in demand, and graph B is a change in quantity demand. B only deals with price. Let's go with that. Number seven, which graph illustrates a change in quantity demanded shown by a movement along the curve? And that's graph B. That little arrow that you see on graph B shows, hey, the price is rising. Okay, so we better decrease our uh, quantity demanded for for our, our consumers. Okay, number eight says what causes a change in quantity demanded? That is price. It's a price thing that affects graph B and only price. Number nine says which graph illustrates a change in demand? And that's shown by a shift. The word shift there is a crucial as well as the word uh, change in demand. That's going to be graph A. And so what's going to cause that shift to happen? Well, there's going to be a new market conditions, and it's going to be caused by one of the demand determinants. Okay, And we'll look at uh, what those demand determinants are in just a second. Okay, But those demand determinants will cause a shift either as you uh, go to the right for more, an increase, or the left, which is less, a decrease. So what are those determinants? That's a good question. Here we go. So we've got income, market size, consumer tastes, consumer expectations, substitute goods, and complementary goods. And here they are defined. For income, consumers get more or less money. And because of that, it's going to affect what they buy. It's as simple as that. Uh, market size, in other words, says that consumers move into or away from an area. We just had a Super Bowl. So the city that hosted the Super Bowl had a giant influx of people. Okay, their market size drastically increased. Okay, and so that affected the demand. So it was be more people there, so it's going to shift to the right. Uh, so consumer tastes is the next one. Okay, consumers give product status or take status away from that product. And basically what happens with consumer tastes is people, our buyers, are reacting to the present. Okay, and what they feel about that product. Okay, now consumer expectations, on the other hand, is where consumers are predicting the future. Okay, and their their choices are based off of what those predictions for what the future holds, and that's going to affect whether they buy or, or sell. Uh, substitute goods, in other words, is where consumers use product B in place of product A. Okay, product B price goes down. 
uh, they're going to use that instead of their usual product A that they normally choose. So the substitute goods are examples of like, you know, hot dogs uh, and hamburgers. Okay, so if the price of hot dogs uh, goes up, people are going to eat more hamburgers. Okay, now complementary goods, to use this very similar uh, vein here, is where consumers buy product B the same way as they buy product A. So let's use the hot dogs again. Okay, hot dog prices go down. Well, hot dog buns, you're going to find they're going to buy more hot dog buns because they go together. They complement each other. Okay, peanut butter and jelly, that sort of idea. Right. Next, let's look at the other end of it, of the six supply determinants. Okay, they're input costs, labor productivity, technology, government action, producer expectations, and the number of producers. Input costs, basically, they're the costs of the factors of production. So we'd say that as the price of productive resources are ingredients needed to make a thing, a good or a service. Okay, so as the price goes up, supply goes down. As the price goes down, supply goes up. Labor productivity, another way of thinking of that is like education of your workforce. So the quantity of units of a good or a service producers can make in a given time. Okay, so as productivity increases, supply will also increase. And as productivity decreases, supply will also decrease. Technology is the application of scientific methods and discoveries to production process. So this will result in a new product, okay, or a new manufacturing technique. So, and again, with that relationship, as technology advances, we're going to see that supply will also increase. But when your technology fails, supply, that's gone. It decreases. Uh, so government action, another way they're going to say that might be government regulations. Okay, those are going to be our taxes, our subsidies, or regulations, how they can affect production. We saw this with our price ceilings. We saw this with our price floors. Okay, and so those kind of go hand in hand there, depending on how it's going to work. Is it going to be a ceiling or a floor? The, how that's going to work with the, the regulation and the shift. Producer expectations were sellers, your, your makers, okay, your, your, your producers. They're, they're predicting the future. So the expectations affect the quantity producers will supply. Price is going to increase later. Well, well then there's going to be a decrease in the quantity they supply now. But on the other hand, if they know that prices will decrease later, they're going to increase the quantity supplied now. Okay, sell, sell, sell. Uh, make as much profit as you can. So the number of producers, another way they might say that is the number of sellers. Okay, competitors move into a market. That means that there are more producers of that good or a service. Okay, that's going to increase the total quality, uh, the total quantity uh, supplied. And as those competitors leave, we're going to see that quantity supplied will then decrease. Okay, but individually, the more producers that you have, you're going to see uh, individually uh, a decrease in quantity supplied per business. Okay, each business will make less things because there's more people making them, even though totally uh, the total quantity supplied out of all of the industry will increase. Okay, if if, if people around you close then individually, you're going to see an increase in the quantity supplied because everybody's coming to you for the product or the, or the good or the service. Okay. Um, so there's that. All right. Next questions. 13. Is the supply increasing or decreasing in the shift illustrated below? Okay. So which way is the shift? We know what's the supply because we have an S1 and an S2. It's labeled clearly on there. So which way is the arrow going to go? It's going to go that way. All right, so then we have to think, all right, well, then what does that mean? That means, boom, there's our original equilibrium point, and it shifts to this new equilibrium point. So that's definitely going to be an increase in the shift. Okay, so the supply, that quantity, is increasing. On the other hand, for number 14, we're looking at, again, an S1, S2, okay, and uh, how they intersect along that demand line. So which way is it going to shift? Well, it shifts to the right, right? No, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. Ha, good call. It's shifting to the left. Okay, so our original equilibrium point here, again, I said left, I meant left, left, left is less. Okay, so we look at our new equilibrium point that way. Okay, moving on. 15, which graph shows what would happen 
uh, if the supply of Snickers, if the uh, factory got a new, better machine. So what does that mean? We're looking at graph D, okay? So the, the machine's new, it's better. That means it is just cranking out Snickers left and right, so the supply will increase. And that's what you're seeing with graph D. Number 16 says, which graph shows what would happen if the supply of Snickers, to the supply of Snickers, if the Kroger's decided uh, to decrease the price of the candy bar? Well, that's going to be graph A because that is a price question. The price is the one that is affecting our supply. No, no other determinant, okay, just price. Okay, so when you see that, you're going to see a decrease in our price, okay, and our quantity offered. So graph A for number 16. Number 17 says, which graph shows what would happen to the supply of Snickers if peanuts became more expensive? All right, so... Peanuts. Peanuts are more expensive. That, guys, that's called input costs, the cost of the factors of production. That's why we're shifting. That's why we're choosing C, okay? Because the peanuts are more expensive, it's going to cost more to make the Snickers in general. And because the overall costs of the production factors will increase, then our supply will decrease. On the other hand, number 18 says, hey, which graph illustrates a change in the production of Little Debbie cakes if sugar became cheaper? So now what you have to figure out is, is this going to be a supply change or a demand change? Now here's how you do that. Okay, we're looking at number 18. You're saying, hey, this is a supply issue. Okay, so input costs. Again, input costs are cheaper, so it's a supply issue. We have to choose graph A because sugar is cheaper. We can make more of it because it's not going to cost us as much. So graph A for number 18. Number 19, which graph illustrates a change in the cells of Little Debbie cakes once they were found to contain harmful bacteria? Well, okay, harmful bacteria that's going to affect people wanting to actually buy it. So that's going to be consumer taste. Consumer taste is a demand determinant. Okay, and that's where we're going to choose graph D because we're going to see less people want to buy the Little Debbies. All right, so graph D. Number 20, which graph illustrates a change in the production of Little Debbie cakes if an important machine broke? Okay, so your machine's broken, that's technology, and it's not working for you, it's technology failure. Uh, technology is a supply determinant. Graph C is going to be the best answer because your supply is going to decrease. Moving on. Equilibrium. Okay, so basically you want equilibrium. What is it? It's the point where the supply and the demand curve intersect. Okay, number 22 asks you to define equilibrium price, or another way of saying that is market clearing price. And the way you, I, you ideally identify that is the ideal price needed to clear a market. I'm using air quotes on that. So basically you're selling goods or services. Uh, or another way of saying it is that your quantity supplied is equal to your quantity demanded. Okay, because they are intersecting. Number 23 says to find equilibrium quantity. It's the amount of units, goods or services, bought and sold at the equilibrium price. You want to have this equilibrium quantity. You want to have this equilibrium price. Okay, because if you don't, then you have disequilibrium. And that happens when the, uh, the market is not not in balance because there is an excess supply or there is excess demand. So what happens when, when we get those things? Well, we get surplus or shortage, okay? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, number 24 says, define surplus. That is the quantity supplied is greater than, is greater than, quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded. You have excess supply for number 24, that's surplus, okay? You don't want that. On the other hand, you also don't want number 25. Define shortage, that's what quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded, excess demand. So let me see if I said this exactly right. This 24 and 25, go with this. 24, define surplus, the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded, excess supply. Number 25, define shortage, the quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded, there's excess demand. Okay, so number 26 says, to fix a shortage, should you make the price of a product cheaper or more expensive? Well, 
it's a shortage, okay? And that means that people are just buying it too easily and too quickly. So you need to raise the price because they're probably willing to pay more. So you're gonna make it more expensive. And also to fix a surplus, should you make the price of the product cheaper and more expensive? Well, cheaper for God's sakes, because people aren't buying it. They're saying, hey, this is way too expensive for me. I'm not going near that. But if you keep lowering the price, you will find that more and more people will buy it. And what you want is that sweet spot. You want that market clearing price where it is going in and out. Okay. So we have a graph. We have a schedule here, a price, quantity, supplied, quantity, demanded. Okay, price is a dollar, three dollars, six dollars. So looking at that, we should be able to say, hey, which one is going to be our equilibrium? Which one is our surplus? Which one is our shortage? So number 28 says uh, above is a schedule for French fries. Okay, so the surplus is going to happen at six dollars because at six dollars you'll get 80 units made, and only about 30 people are willing to pay that six dollars for those French fries. Everyone else says, nah, no thanks, I'm good, okay? Number 29 says, at what price would there be a shortage? Well, it's gonna be a dollar because everybody wants French fries for a dollar. 90 people, in fact, will want that, but only 20 uh, units of French fries will be supplied based off of how you would uh, accurately predict your production methods. So because of that, there's a shortage. Now, on the other hand, there's an equilibrium of three bucks. You'll get about 60 people that will buy it if you make 60 units. Okay, and then once that's gone, then you make another 60 units and another 60 people will come and buy it. That's your equilibrium. Now, looking at 31 and 32, okay, 31 says, is equilibrium price increasing or decreasing on the graph above? All right, so we see that there's a shift to the right. All right, so quick, 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 let's think. All right, what does that mean? Well, okay, we're going from that equilibrium point to this equilibrium point now. Okay, so uh, equilibrium price is going from looks like about 32 all the way down to about 20. Okay, so because of that, we can see that the price is definitely decreasing. Now, on the other hand, using the same points, and we want to ask about the equilibrium quantity. So here's our first quantity, a little bit above 400. Okay. And then we'd say, all right, well, what's our new equilibrium quantity, our E2? Well, it's going to be here, okay, closer to about 660, 670. All right, so that's definite increase. So the number 32, the equilibrium quantity is increasing. All right, so let's go from there to this. Defining price ceiling, number 33. Number 33 is when a government agency puts a limit on the maximum price that can be charged for a good or service. And that's usually, that's going to be below the equilibrium. Okay. So uh, uh, one example of a price ceiling is rent control. All right. They say you cannot charge more than this. This is the maximum price you can charge for this apartment. When they have that happen, you're going to see that there's going to be way more demand then they can supply for that. So 35 says, do price ceilings lead to shortages or surpluses? Why? It leads to a shortage because quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded. 36 says, define price floor. Okay, that definition says this, when a government agency sets a minimum price that can be charged for a good or service, they usually put that above the equilibrium point, okay? Two examples of that for number 37. First would be minimum wage. Minimum wage says you have to at least pay people this. This is the, the least amount, the minimum price that you can pay people to work for you. Uh, another thing that they do for a uh, price floor is says, hey, farmers, you're, you're making this, uh, this, this food here for us, this wheat, this grain. There's going to be a minimum price people are going to pay for that. Now, why? You don't want farmers going out of business because they make food. And if they're not making food, we die because we're starving. Um, so that's a, that's a deal there. So minimum wage and like uh, farmer subsidies and that kind of deal. Uh, number 38 says, do price floors lead to shortages or surpluses? Why? They lead to surpluses because quantity supplied is more than quantity demanded. 
And what we'll look at later is, uh, you know, how that particularly works. But just know that a price floor leads to a surplus. That happens because uh, quantity supplied is more than your quantity demanded. Okay. Now here's this graph. And it says, hey, listen, number 39, if the government imposed an artificial minimum price at $7, all right, let's look on the graph, here's $7, uh, at, is this a price floor or a ceiling? Okay, is, where's it at in a relation to the equilibrium point? Right, it's above the equilibrium point, so there's a surplus. Okay, what problem might lead to this? Again, surplus. Now, let's look at that, though. Basically, what we're seeing here, now look at the points where it connects, all right? is that you're going to produce seven units of a thing but consumers are only going to want three units of that okay seven minus three that is a four unit surplus that we have to deal with here okay so that's that's the deal for number 39 now number 40 if the government imposed an artificial maximum price at two dollars is this a price floor or a ceiling that's a price ceiling what problem might this lead to is it a surplus or is it a shortage it's going to be a shortage Okay, because here, $2, all right? Again, look at the points where they intersect. Now, consumers are going to want to have eight units, but producers, if they're following the schedule right, are only going to make and be able to afford to make two units. That gives us a six-unit shortage of eight minus two. All right, so last bit says you are a candy bar producer. Automatically, we know this is going to have something to do with supply because they use the word producer. Okay, and one day a machine breaks. Ah, we know it has something to do with technology because we talk about machinery. And it's breaking, so left is less. Okay, so automatically we know how our graph should look. You are a candy bar producer. One day a machine breaks at your factory, significantly impacting the amount of candy you are able to produce. It's broken, it's not producing, so it's gonna be less. Answer the following questions about this scenario. First, we have to label our graph, right? S for supply, D for demand. I'd, I'd even go as far as to say, hey, yep, okay, you know what your demand is? Yep, you know what your supply is, but where's your equilibrium point? That's important too, okay? So uh, you do that. What is changing in this scenario, supply or demand? Remember, you're a producer, you're making things. If you are making things, you are, it's a supply issue, okay? Uh, and then three says, what determinant causes change? We know it's technology, okay? So it's a supply, so which determinant? Technology, machine broke, okay? Again, so the machine broke, you're not making le uh, a lot of stuff, boom, that is a left arrow, left is less, okay? It's pointing to the new supply curve, which should look right here, okay? Make sure you label it too, okay? Also to try to make sure you know where that new equilibrium point is. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're going from here to here, and based off that, you can do, just like I did earlier, just draw the line down, okay, and, and over, and you can figure out what's changing. It says, it says for number five, did the equilibrium price increase or decrease after this change? Well, our equilibrium price, as you can see, rose. Y-axis goes up, okay? Uh, our quantity, however, our equilibrium quantity decreases. I know I didn't ask for that, but if you're reading the graph, that's what you're seeing. Okay, guys, those are your answers. Hopefully, uh, I can get this uploaded for you guys, and the technology is not too bad. Thanks, and have a great day.